Welcome everybody on behalf of Holocaust Museum LA. My name is Rachel Podburn. I'm the Education Programs Manager at the museum. I'm pleased to welcome you to our discussion with Ben Lesser, a Holocaust survivor from Poland. Before we begin, I would like to share a few words about our museum. Uh, Holocaust Museum LA is the first and oldest Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. In the 1960s, a group of survivors worked together to create a memorial for their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust. And this memorial eventually became Holocaust Museum LA. These survivors did so at a time when the community was by and large not ready to face this tragic history. Thanks to their courage and their foresight, these survivors established the first Holocaust Museum in the United States with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. This morning, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Ben Lesser, who will share his story with you, as well as his daughter, Gail Lesser Gerber, who will contribute as well. Ben is the founder of the Zahor Remembrance Foundation in Las Vegas, a nonprofit educational organization with a mission to educate about the Holocaust. After Ben shares his story, you will have the opportunity to ask questions. To those watching on Zoom, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. And to those watching on Facebook, you can type your questions into the comments section. Uh, he will answer as many questions as possible. Thank you so much, Ben and Gail, for joining us this morning. And you may begin. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Holocaust Museum Los Angeles, for enabling me to get my message across. Um, yes, my friends, I come to you from an era in history where civilization lost its humanity, its heart, a time when there were only three kinds of people in this world. There were the killers, the victims, and the bystanders. The rest of the world, knowing what's happening to the Jewish people, chose to be bystanders. That was giving Hitler carte blanche to do with the Jewish people whatever he wanted. And he did. Six million for their departed ones. Slaughtered, slaughtered by the Nazis. Unbelievable. But you know, the world chose to ignore it. And what Hitler did is just something that I can't get it out of me. And I have to keep talking about it and telling about it. And, and this is why I'm doing this. Uh, my whole life has been dedicated to keep the memory alive, to keep this world from acquiring amnesia. I lived in Krakow, Poland, in a beautiful building, and I have a wonderful family of seven. My father, Lazar Lesser, my mother, Shari Moishi, my oldest brother, Lola Lieber Schwartz. She is the only one who survived the Holocaust, plus myself, Goldie Lesser, my older sister, and the middle one, that was me when I was 12 years old, Tuli, my little brother. Out of the family of seven, only the two of us survived, Lola and myself. The rest were all slaughtered. What can I tell you? Um, I don't know where to begin. We lived in a beautiful city and I had a beautiful life. And actually I had a double home. My mother comes from Munkacz, Hungary. Um, and my father was from Krakow, Poland. And of course the marriage was in Krakow. And every year my mother would take us kids to Hungary, to Munkacz, to her side of the family to be together with her family and, and spend the summer over there. In the winter, we would come back and we'd go to school. Now this was going on every year until 
until the war broke out. When the war broke out in 1945, the whole world changed for us. I remember we lived in this building on Starovishla Street in a beautiful major thoroughfare, a three-story apartment house. Our apartment was on the uh, ground floor on the on the right side of the building looking forward. And on the left side of, from the gate, there was another Jewish family, a young couple who had two, two daughters. And the mother gave birth to an infant little boy about two months before the war broke out. And early morning, this whole building started to shake and rattle. So I ran to the window of my bedroom to look out what happened and what I saw were tanks rolling down the streets. And following the tanks, there were half tracks. Every few steps, a soldier would jump out from the half track with the rifle, get on the sidewalk. And this is how they occupied the city. There was no fighting. And following the half tracks, they were the Wehrmachts, the foot soldiers with the shiny black boots and their goose steps. It was quite impressionable for a 11 year old kid. I wasn't quite 11 year old old at the time when the war broke out. And when we saw this, we really didn't know what to expect, what's coming. But right as this, the, the procession of the tanks and the soldiers passed, my father called us kids into the dining room. He sat us down on the chair. He says, okay, kids, from this moment on, you're all adults. There are no more children in this house. You will listen, you will obey, you will do exactly what you told. We didn't know what to expect. And this is what we did. We, we were obedient. And we listened to our parents and did everything we could. But it didn't take long. On the fifth day after occupation of Krakow, we found out what Nazi brutality was all about. A truck pulls up to the gate of our building early in the morning, and the soldiers started to bang on the gate. The super came running out with his shirt hanging out. Well, what's going on? All they wanted to know was where the Jewish people lived. And he was quick to oblige. He showed the lessers. He lived on one side and the other family on the other side. They came breaking down the door. In their hands, they had sex, open sex. And they were pistol whipping us. We were still in bed, screaming, throw in all your valuables, money, gold, jewelry, Whatever of value they can find, they threw it into those sacks. And they were beating up my father to open up the safe. While my father is trying to open the safe, we heard this terrible screaming from our neighbor's apartment. My sister Lola and I went through the back door and the, through the kitchen into the yard, into their back door, through their kitchen. We walked in their apartment, and this is what we saw. We saw this monster was holding the baby by its legs, little boy, swinging it and screaming to the parents, making shut up. The parents, the daughters were yelling, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. With a smirk on his face, you can see he was enjoying what he was doing. He smashes the baby's head into the doorpost, killing it instantly. This is a memory that won't leave my mind. Imagining, listening to that little infant screaming in that sudden silence and seeing what came out of his head. My God, what a memory. We all jumped on this monster. And of course, the other soldiers heard something was going on. They came running in. They pistol whipped all of us, pulled us off this monster. 
And they said to him, okay, run. We call him Hans. Okay, Hans, let's go. They put all of the valuables into a sack, threw it in the truck and took off. This was only the fifth day after occupation of Krakow. And from this day on, things started happening, one thing after another. New ordinances, Jewish people had to wear Star of David. There was a, a curfew. You couldn't be in or out of the house or, or of your apartment from seven to seven. From seven in, in the morning, from sorry, I'm sorry, from seven in the evening to seven in the morning, it was curfew. You couldn't travel anymore. Jewish papers were, um, IDs were taken away and new IDs given with a big J in it for Judah, Jewish. We couldn't work here, we couldn't go here, we couldn't travel here. Now, the strange thing is that for the Jewish people in those, those days, there were no judges, no juries, not even police or jails. If a Jewish person disobeyed any of the ordinances given, there is simply one punishment for the Jewish people, death. They shot you right on the spot. And every morning they were going around in push carts picking up these bodies. It was unbelievable. It's a world you can't imagine. It was like living in hell. New ordinances kept coming in and new ordinance came in is that Jewish people may no longer reside in Krakow. But they gave us a choice. If you wanted to stay in Krakow, you had to go in to Botkuzhe, that's the other side of the river. They made a ghetto. You had to go inside the ghetto. Or the second choice was you can live in a small community anywhere outside of Krakow, but not in a big city. Big cities, they made ghettos. And this went on and on for a while. And of course, my, I had a sister, Lola. She was a beautiful girl. She must have been about 15 and a half, maybe 16 at the time. And she had a young man who was a suitor of hers. He was in love with her and everybody in the family knew it. One day she comes home. I mean, one day my future brother-in-law, Michael, her boyfriend comes to my father and he says, Mr. Lesser, you know how I feel about Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her, but do me a favor. And why don't you come to move to the same communities that my family is moving to? It was called Nyepolomitsa. Well, given a choice going into the ghetto or going to Nyepolomitsa, my father chose Nyepolomitsa. And my future brother-in-law, Michael, said, I'm going to help you load. And he did. He came and started to help us load everything into big bags. He hired a horse and buggy with a driver and he helped us load everything. My father's business was wine and syrup. He had the wine and syrup manufacturing, a big factory. And he also had a chocolate factory. He was the first man to manufacture chocolate covered wafers, something like Kit Kat in Europe. In those days, it was in the shape of little animals like kid, bears, rabbits with tin foil on it. I remember every time my father would come home and work at the evening, 
us kids would search his pockets to find some goodies. And we, he always made sure that he had some in his pockets. Those were the good days, but they didn't last long. Now we are loading up that wagon. We find out that, by the way, both businesses were confiscated. One day my father went to the, the wine and syrup manufacturer and there was a station guard. They chased him away, confiscated. So he went to the chocolate factory the same way, confiscated. They wouldn't even let him go in and take his briefcase. While we we're loading the wagon to leave Krakow, we found out that my father had 1,000 American dollars that he saved up for a rainy day. You know, 1,000 American dollars in those days was a small fortune. He took those bills and he pasted it in a religious book between the pages. He put it, closed it up and put it in the sack full of other books. We had two sacks full of books with religious books. They loaded it on the wagon and we're now leaving Krakow to go to Nepalomitsa. On our way, we're being stopped, halted by the Nazis. Two husky Nazis jump on the wagon and all they wanted to know do you have any Jewish books, the literature? And they saw two sacks full of Jewish literature. They picked it up and heaved it on the side of the road by the next on the side of the road. And we saw a mountain full of books. Apparently, every Jewish person who did not go into the ghetto had to cross this road and they were confiscating these books and they were going to have a bonfire after everybody passed. My sister Lola spoke a beautiful German and she walks up to this Nazi and she says, look, my father is a writer. He wrote his autobiography. Let him keep this one book. He looks at her, maybe he liked the way she spoke a beautiful German. He says, okay, we'll give you five minutes if you can find it. And the whole family started to climb on that mountain of books to find this one book. They all looked alike. They were all brown or black leather covered. You couldn't find it and after five minutes, we kept sliding down, they chased us away. As they chased us away, my father has a family of six to support. He doesn't have a penny left to his name. He's going to a new community, not like he can get a new job because Jewish people were not allowed to be hired. You couldn't recognize him. I say we had six on the wagon with us but we were a family of seven. My sister Goldie, my oldest sister, when the war broke out, she was caught with my grandparents in Munkac, which is now Hungary. Because of that, she was safe. She was in a free country, Hungary. But my father had the rest of the family, family of six, not a penny to his name. I remember we arrived to Nepalomitsa, to that small community. My future brother-in-law somehow managed to rent a farmhouse, an apartment in a farmer's house. This is the picture of the house. By the way, all these pictures that you're going to see are pictures that my sister Lola, the one who survived, painted five years after the war from memory. 
and this is the farmhouse that he rented. One half of the farmhouse was the farmers, an apple orchard farmer. The other half was our apartment, which was actually just one big room. No, no indoor plumbing, we had an outhouse. It was really primitive. But between the two apartments in the hallway, there was a big baking oven because every people used to bake their own bread. So when we came into this house, my father broken hearted, my future brother-in-law knew what happened to my father. He brought him a sack full of flour, a hundred pounds of flour, figuring he'll be able to bake bread for the, to feed the family. When my father saw the flour, his face lit up. Instead of baking bread, he started to bake pretzels. Why pretzels? All you need for pretzels is flour, water, and salt. And those ingredients he had. Then he took those pretzels to the neighboring bars, taverns, and he offered it for sale. It was a novelty. People started to buy these pretzels. Now my father can afford to bake a bread to feed the family. And before you knew it, my father became a little baker in that community. Don't ask me how, I still do, don't know how he ever knew how to bake, but he did. He baked pretzels, he baked all kinds of rolled cakes, mandel bread, the Jewish biscotti that he baked, a chali, a braided bread, beautiful pieces. He was just, and I was 12 years old. And I remember I baked with him. To this day, I still remember how to bake. And I take pleasure when I get a chance to bake something to bring my memory back because there were no recipes. Everything was done just by tasting, okay? So, and meanwhile, Lola marries Michael. And we have a wedding in our little house there. That was not allowed because there, you were not allowed to gather a few Jewish people outside of the family, maybe two extra people, that's all. We had about 30 people guests for Lola and Michael's wedding. The pictures that you see with all the people, plus other people that were not in the picture, out of all these 30 people, only three of us survived. Lola, my future brother, my brother-in-law at that time, Michael, and myself. This is the only picture of me when I was 12 years old. And you can see my little brother, Tuli, and leaning against this, my mother, Shari Lesser. Out of all these people, only the three of us were fortunate enough to survive. Now that Lola and Michael got married, they moved out of the house and they moved into a duplex. The owner of the duplex lived in one apartment, the other apartment they lived in. And the owner happened to be the mayor of this community. So he went ahead and he tells Michael and Lola, Michael, Lola, save yourselves. I heard rumors there's going to be a raid against the Jewish people, either tonight or tomorrow. Just go ahead, save yourself. So when Michael heard that that night, he went out and he went, he hired a, a wagon with a driver, horse and buggy. In the middle of the night, we snuck out with whatever we could carry, put it on the wagon. The only place we could go was the nearest city, which was called Bochnia. Bochnia was a mid-sized city, 
in Bosnia had a ghetto. That meant we had to go inside the ghetto. But Bosnia ghetto had very bad reputation. What happened? Every so often, two or three dump trucks would come in in the middle of the night. They would go up and down the streets in Bosnia ghetto and go from house to house and pull out the children from their beds and throw them into these dump trucks. You can imagine the parents screaming for the children, the children screaming for the parents. As they filled up these dump trucks, they started to pull out of the truck of the of the um, ghetto. Obviously, the parents were running behind these trucks and screaming for their children. But these cultured people had machine guns at the end of each truck. As the parents were running behind, they mowed down the parents and killed everybody. That resonated throughout Europe. Stay away from Bosnia ghetto because of these atrocities. But we had no choice. We had to go in there or stay in Nepalom. It's a, a good thing we left because Nepalom was raided the night after and thousands of people were pulled pushed into trucks, taken to the forest and given shovels, the men were given shovels to dig a big ditch and everyone was lined up and shot. How do we know this? Gail, my, my, my daughter and I, I was, of course, after the war I survived, my Gail and I went to Nyepalamitsa to find out what happened. I'm sorry. It was Lola. My, yeah, Lola, Lola, my sister. Forgive me. My sister Lola and I who survived, we went to Nyepalamitsa to find out what happened to all the people. And they told us that the story with the trucks pulling them into the forest and shooting them. How did they find out? The farmers who went to the forest to pick mushrooms early in the morning and berries to sell in the market, they saw the trucks pull in. They were hiding behind trees and they saw the whole thing. So they were telling us that the ground was moving for days afterwards. They just covered everybody up and they didn't care if you're alive or dead, you were buried. So it's a good thing we left and we went into Bosnia ghetto. In Bosnia ghetto, uh, we didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, Michael, my brother-in-law, sees a friend of his who happened to be a Jewish policeman inside the ghetto. The ghetto had Jewish policemen. They had no weapons. All they had was a baton. Their job was to keep order inside the ghetto. So. He sees Michael, he says, what are you doing here? And Michael is telling him the story. So he says, okay, Michael, and, and to us, don't worry, we'll find you a place. He found a place for Michael and his family. And he found a place for my mother, father, my little brother, and myself. Now, just to give you an idea of what ghetto living was like in, in ghetto, they put us into a room and there were eight other people in this room. Now we were a dozen, 12. There were no beds. All we had was straw on the ground and there were blankets hanging in the ceilings separating each family. And on top of the straw on the ground, there were blankets. And this is how we lived next to each other in one room with all the things that was going on between these people, you can just imagine staying in one room. And this took place for almost a year. Inside the ghetto, you had to work. If you didn't work, you did not receive any rations. I was about 12, almost 12 and a half. I worked in a uniform factory sewing on buttons on uniforms. It was easy work, but it was 13 hours a day, very little food, very little sleep. Life was miserable. 
One day, Farber, this friendly Jewish policeman inside the ghetto, comes to Michael and he says, Michael, Lola, save yourselves. I heard there's going to be a rumor tonight or tomorrow. Save yourself. Now, ever since those trucks would pull into the ghetto and pull out, push, pull out the kids from bed, throw them into these dump trucks, every house in every apartment had a hiding place. They called it bunkers. That's when I found out our bunker for the 12 of us was this ornate piece of furniture where you hang your jackets and coats. As you opened up the door, you pushed the clothing apart, the back panel would slide apart and there was a hole in the wall. The 12 of us could crawl through the hole and stand between two buildings. The last person had to close the door, put the closing back in place, the back panel back in place. And there we stood all night jittering, frozen into the, in the, in the snowy night. It was snowing outside. And fortunate for us, the building outside were connected. So they couldn't see us. But the roofs were open between the two buildings. And it was snowing. It was freezing cold. And we were holding each other. And we hear shootings, screamings dogs barking all night long, yelling, shooting. Towards morning, it suddenly got quiet. When it got quiet, we dared to come out. When we walked outside the room, we couldn't believe what our eyes had seen. People torn apart by dogs. Mothers holding their infant babies dead, shot over right in the temple. Uh, pieces of people laying on the snow, and there were push bars going around and picking up these bodies and pieces of bodies, piling it on the push carts. And then they were taking it to the ghetto square and piling up these bodies as high as you can. And then these cultured people took gasoline and poured gasoline over the bodies. And they started a human bonfire in Bochner Ghetto Square. Can you imagine the smell, the feeling, the fright, what was going on inside the ghetto for the few people, few people who might have hidden and survived like us? But we knew that my sister Lola and Michael were also hiding out in another place. And his parents were hiding in a doghouse. So we went, went there to find out what happened to them. When we went there, this is what we found out. Lola is telling the story as they were about to go into the doghouse. An other Jewish policeman walks up to them with his mother and his sister. He says, Michael, I know about your hiding place inside this doghouse. Unless you take my mother and my sister with you, I'm going to tell the authorities. So their hands were tied. They had to allow them in. But now there were nine people. There was only room for seven. So Michael and Lola volunteered to stay out and they walked away. As they walked away and the others went into the, the doghouse, they walked away and Lola is walking with Michael, this friendly policeman, this friendly couple, called, we call them couple. Farber walks up, he says, Lola, Michael, what are you doing? Why aren't you hiding someplace? You know what's about to happen. So Michael tells him the story. He says, don't worry where my sister and her two children are hiding, there is room for you. Come, follow me. He took him to a leather tannery. Above the tannery, there's a water tank. He says, my sister and her two children are inside that water tank. Climb up that ladder, lower yourself with a rope, and all night stay there quietly 
towards morning, I'll give you a, a, a knock on the tank, which will indicate the coast is clear and you can come out, which is exactly what happened. And Lola is telling the story as they come down, they see his sister knee deep in water, the little girl waist high in water and shivering. And the mother is holding an infant little boy who is asleep in her arm. So Lola took the infant little boy from the mother and Michael picked up the girl from the water and they stood in the water jittering all night long and hearing the same thing we hear, shootings, dogs barking, screaming, yelling. Towards morning, they hear that knock, that friendly knock from, from Farber. He says, it's time to come out. Well, as they pulled themselves out and they came out and they put some circulation back into their legs, the first thing Lola Michael wanted to do is what happened to his parents and his family in the doghouse. So they went to the doghouse and this is what they found. Everyone in the family with a bullet hole in the head laying in the snow shot. Lola saw that, she started to scream, and Michael stopped her. He says, Lola, you can't. They're still burning those bodies, they're gonna hear you. So with a quelched cry, they knew what they had to do. According to the Jewish religion, you're supposed to bury your loved one within 24 hours. So Michael and Lola went out and they found a really real barrel, a really real barrel. They put the family on it. Marika, his little sister, is still holding her doll that Lola made her for her birthday. And they're taking them to the cemetery. On top of the cemetery, they found a shovel and with the frozen ground and Lola's bare hands they were able to make out the grave and big enough to bury the family. <clears throat> what happened from this point on is a very, very long story. And I don't have enough time as much as I'd like to tell you, to tell you the story. All I could tell you is um, they buried the family from the, and then there they went back to their apartment. There were loudspeakers going around that all the Jewish people had to register in the union route, the Jewish police stations. And anyway, Lola and Michael registered. And when they asked Lola all the questions and they found out that she was a Hungarian citizen, um, they, the, the head of Gestapo from Bochnia wanted to see her in her, his office the next day to tell you the story, what happened in his office. And the, the, the acceptance, how he accepted Lola and what he did and how we were able afterwards to falsify papers um, showing that um, Lola and my family, our Hungarian citizen, we are exempt from the ghetto, exempt from the Star of David. You don't have to live in ghetto. A whole big story. And anyway, my family started a whole uh, underground falsifying documents so that people from inside the ghetto had, had the chance to get out of the ghetto. And about over 50 people lost our family were able to get out of the ghetto. And while outside the ghetto, my future brother-in-law, which is a beautiful story in itself, and it wasn't so simple. The head of Gestapo, Stapo Schombro, eventually was executed by the Nazis for, for helping Jewish people it's a very, very interesting story. Um, anyway, outside the ghetto, my brother-in-law finds a driver who was hauling coal and he approached him with, he 
converted truck into a double decker where people could hide between the coal and the chassis. And he agreed, we will pay him a lot of money. Among those 50 people we saved, there was one family that was very wealthy and they were able to pay our fare for everybody. And he agreed. He converted the truck into a double decker, coal on top, and between the coal and the chassis, 10 people could hide. He would take him, us to the border, and at the border, we, we had a smuggler waiting to smuggle us up to the border and across the border into Czechoslovakia from Czechoslovakia from Hungary. This again is a long story. It's worthwhile reading, absolutely beautiful, how we were able to get out and, and how I and my little brother inside this truck, 10 of us like sardines, between the, the coal and the chassis, were able to get to the border, even though we were stopped by the Nazis on the way, and they hitchhiked on top of the coal, not knowing that there were 10 people under the coal hiding, and, and they never knew, and, and they left, and then we were able to get to the border, and how we crossed this border. And it wasn't so simple with a smuggler, my God, um, it's a story in itself. All I can tell you is please, when you get a chance, check it out. Either read my book or read my entire story. I don't have the time for this right now. But at this point, we're crossing the border and we eventually wind up in Budapest, Hungary. I and my little brother, Tuli, my sister, Lola, and Michael. My father and mother, who was supposed to follow, were found out somehow a, a Polish farmer saw, saw them go into the truck. They called the Gestapo. They came and they pulled them out and everyone was shot. Can, can you show the truck, Gail? I'd appreciate it. Um, again, where everyone was pulled out of the truck between the coal and the chassis, they were all lined up, all 10 people, plus the driver who wasn't Jewish against the wall and everyone was shot. How we know this, this is also a part of the story that you're gonna have to read. But right now we are in Hungary and we're very happy to be in a free country. This was in 1943, in late summer of 1943, we're in, in, in Budapest, Hungary. To, in order to legalize us, I had to go into a jail for a short period of time with my little brother. My uncle would watch for us because we were minors and he had to sign some documents and then they released us. And his, um, you know, he would be our, be our guardian and we were able to leave Budapest to go to Munkac, Hungary, where my grandparents, my sister Goldie, my uncles, my cousins, my whole mother side of the family lived in Munkac, Hungary. And they were all waiting for us, of course, a beautiful reunion. And we told them everything that was going on. It was hard to believe, even though the family believed us. But the rest of the people in Munkac, life was going on like normal, weddings, bar mitzvahs, proms, um, graduations, people were going on about their life, Jewish people, like nothing ever happened. When I told them what's happening in Poland, most of them didn't believe it. Oh, it's a kid telling a story. And then those who did believe had, they would say, but this could never happen in Hungary 
because Hungary is an ally of Germany, why would Hitler siphon off soldiers from the front to occupy a friendly country? It didn't make sense. And it didn't make sense. But my uncle who invited me to stay in his house with my little brother, he believed me. And I said to him, uncle, if the Nazis ever come into Hungary, all of your wealth will be taken away. He was a very rich man. He had a, a um, beautiful store selling yardage goods for, for suits and dresses. And above the store, he had his house where we lived. And I told him everything would be taken away. It would make a lot of sense if you could convert some of your valuables into diamonds or jewelry, some things that we can hide on our body. He listened to us. It made sense to him, he listened to us. And one day he comes home with boxes full of shoes, a pair of shoes for every member of the family. He told us, knows that in the heels of these shoes, there are diamonds. Use it only in a life-threatening situation when you have to save your life, know it. And he distributed these shoes. Certainly in March of 1944, the Nazis just marched into Hungary like they were invited guests. When they came in, they knew every Jewish person, their name, their addresses, their profession, their education, businesses, everything. How? They didn't have computers in those days like they do today. IBM had punch cards and they would sell these punch cards with this information to anyone who would pay the price. Now IB, IBM doesn't deny it, but they say they had no idea of what purpose they're gonna use these punch cards. Within two months time after occupation of Hungary, they were shipping out transports of loads of people, death trains to the death camps of, of Poland and Germany. This is what they told us. Germany needs workers. Every able-bodied man and woman will be working in Germany, you'll be trans, uh, you'll be transferred to Germany, you'll be working in Germany. Children will be schooled, older people will be cared for, bring along all your valuables that you can carry, but leave everything else behind. Anyone found hiding will be shot immediately. And this is what happened. People believed it. And with all their bundles and valises, they went to the railroad station to be transferred into Germany into a labor camp. It turns out they put in 80 people into a cattle car, like sardines. You imagine 80 people. We had to stand against each other. It was so tight there because most of the people had valises and bundles that they told us to bring along. So if somebody wanted to sit down, somebody else had to stand up. And imagine if somebody had foods that they brought in and the next guy next to a person didn't have. And this went on for three days, three nights. On the third night, we arrived at a place well, in the train, the, the conditions were so bad. Imagine they had three buckets of water in the corner and after the water was gone, there were no toilets, no sanitary facilities. So they used those buckets to eliminate themselves. And after the human waste was overflowing those buckets already, we were now sitting in, in a human waste. My God, it was a terrible 
terrible ordeal and the third day we arrived at this place called Oshwinchim. There was a sign on the radio station saying Oshwinchim. Oshwinchim was Polish for Auschwitz. We didn't know about an Auschwitz, we had no idea about Oshwinchim, nothing. But the train didn't stop there, it continued a few more miles, and then it stopped. And we see a gate, and on top of the gate it says, Arbeit macht frei, labor gives you freedom. And well, this made sense, it's a labor camp, gives, a labor gives you freedom. That was Auschwitz, but we didn't know that. The train stood there for a couple hours, and then it started to move again for another two or three kilometers. And it stopped at a place called Birkenau. Birkenau was part of Auschwitz. Birkenau was where all the killing was being done. Most of the killing was done in Birkenau. The crematoriums, the gas chambers, the, the shootings, the fire pits, everything was done in Birkenau. We don't know this, who never heard of a Birkenau. They opened the door, the gate, and they started to yelling and all hell broke loose. Everybody rouse, rouse, get out, get out fast and leave all your belongings where it is. Don't you pick any of the bundles up that you had, leave it all there in the train. And they were yelling in different languages, leave it there, don't touch it. And women and children to the right, men to the left. I'm holding on to my sister Goldie, my little brother Tuli, and we're just pulled apart, never to see each other again. They went directly to the gas chambers. Who knew? Who knew? It was nighttime when our train came. Just the picture you see here is a daytime picture. It was nighttime and we lined up in a row. <clears throat> it was a strange place. Ashes were flying all over. We see chimneys with flames shooting out of, and smoke coming out of it. And the ashes are flying all over us and funny smell. And as you walk, you leave footprints in the ashes. Who knew that we are stepping on our dear beloved ones? on the ashes of our loved families. Who knew? Who knew? We had no idea. And we see people are going forward and the head of the line, there is a man like white frog, like a doctor. And he's going with his finger, right, left, right, left, right, left. And when I came close, every once in a while, he would ask somebody a question. When I came close, he asked a young man a question. He says, Kannst du fünf kilometers laufen? Which means, can you run five kilometers? Or would you rather go by truck? And he said that he would rather go by truck because he had a bad knee. The poor soul not realizing that meant he sent you directly to the, to the gas chambers. That meant that this monster that you're looking at, this doctor, was Dr. Mengele. He was ahead of this line asking these questions. And he decided who shall live, who shall die, with a flick of his finger, right, left, death, life, life, death, with a flick of finger. Well, when he asked this question of a young man, it didn't make sense to me. And I was 15 and a half years old. And I went with my uncle, and my cousin uh, lined up. Um, I went with the man rather than with the children, even though I was not a child and I wasn't a man either. But I decided if this is a labor camp, then they want you to labor. And if you labor, they're gonna feed you better. So I went with my uncle, and my cousin, I was 15 and a half, and I hear Mengele ask this question, can you five kilometers run, can you run five kilometers? And the man said he'd rather uh, go by truck. That didn't make sense to me. I see camps, I see the barracks here. Why would he ask the ask question? 
So I figured he's asking the question because he wants to um, determine whether you're strong enough to work. And when I came in front of him, I saluted him. I said, 18 years old, gesund und arbeitsfähig. I'm 18 years old, I'm healthy and I can work. So he asked me, comes to five kilometers laufen, can you run five kilometers? I said, jawohl, yes. He sent me to the left. Well, a story goes on and, and my uncle, my cousin also went to the left. We went to a big auditorium. They told us to get undressed, get out of our clothes and leave all of your clothes and your shoes on the ground and walk over to these barbers. They were going to clip your hair and then send you to the showers. Well, my uncle gave me those diamonds in the shoes, in the black shoes, and he went out of the shoes and his son, my cousin went out of the shoes, but I refused to get out of the shoes. So picture this, I'm getting undressed naked and I'm in beautiful black shoes on me and I walk over to these barbers, they clip my hair. They weren't exactly gentle the way they clipped me either, believe me. And they didn't say anything about these black shoes. And then they sent me into the bathhouse. I took my shower and with the black shoes and there they gave me the striped uniform and they gave me the um, uh, my, my new uh, name which was my ID, 41212, that was my new name from that point on, on a wooden disc. And from this point on, I couldn't miss it, that I would always have to have it on me. And, they, and I walk out of there holding my shoes under my jacket and walking out from the shower, going to the barracks. As it's still nighttime and we've come to the barracks. In front of the barracks, there is a, uh, a Stubmelt, as the, the man in charge of the barracks walks out and he counts us. And this is what he tells us, us. Ha, you Hungarian Jews, you think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes, those flames? Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you're told, this is how you're gonna wind up ashes. Well, and he told us that at first we thought he was pulling our leg. This is the 20th century. These are cultured people. They're burning thousands and thousands of people in ashes. My sister, my little brother, ashes. They couldn't believe it. But we soon found out the truth, what was going on to, in Auschwitz. My dear friend, what I found out was going on to Auschwitz, I could talk about for another half an hour. I heard and saw people being thrown alive into fiery pits. You can't imagine the screaming that was going on for two weeks. And inside the barrack, we were one barrack away from the fiery pits. Day and night, we heard these screams of these people being thrown in there, alive, half alive. And to tell you uh, about the gassing and about, about pulling out the gold teeth and and then cutting the hair and and then, uh, it's so much to tell. I'm going to have to skip it because I'm being winged by my daughter. My time is running short. Anyway, after two weeks, they put us in trucks and they took us to a labor camp. And the labor camp, it was a rock quarry, it was called Dernhau. Dernhau was an offshoot of. Um, um, Oh, forgot the name already. But it doesn't matter. It was a rock quarry. Our Gross job, Rosen. Yeah, Gross Rosen. Gross Rosen, an offspring of Gross Rosen. All it was was a rock quarry. And as they dynamited the mountain, 
It was our job with sledgehammers to break the pieces of rock into manageable pieces, throw it into mining carts, run it down the hill to the grinding machine and roll it, run it back up, very back-breaking work. And I figured my uncle will never survive this work. So I went to the chef of the kitchen who happened to be sleeping in the same barracks that we were in the barrack. And I offered him the diamonds from my shoes to give my uncle a job in the kitchen. And he accepted the diamonds and gave my uncle a job in the kitchen. So it was easier now. My uncle could eat in the kitchen a lot and whatever rations he had, he would then share it with his son and me. And so it got a little easier. Every day as we came from work, we had to line up in the camp and they counted us. Now every worker inside the camp had to come out and also be counted. So my uncle was in the kitchen working. He had to come out from the kitchen, line up with us. He came in front of me and we were lined, lined up in rows of five and they counted us and they counted us and they counted and counted. And the commandant comes down one day. Usually after they counted us, they dismissed us. We went for our rations and began into our barrack. But this time they just kept counting. And the commandant comes down and he says, I'm gonna show the Schweinhund a lesson they will never forget. I'm gonna teach these pigs, dogs, the lessons they'll never forget. What happened? Three of the inmates escaped. And because of that, it is he orders the, their henchmen to pull out every 10th person in line to receive 25 lashes because, because of those three inmates escaping. And as they were pulling out every 10th person in line, I can see that my uncle who is in front of me is gonna be a 10. So I pushed him behind me and I took his place. I figured he'll never survive a beating. So I went and I took his place and they took us number 10 in the middle of the yard. They brought down bundles of hardwood stakes, one by one, maybe about two feet long. And they brought down a sawhorse. This is what the sawhorse looks like. And this is what they made us do. They had us tiptoe bend over the sawhorse. Your stomach could not touch the two by four on the sawhorse. One man would hold your trousers tight and the other one would start the hitting. You had to start counting out loud. Now, as you miscounted, you start from one again. If your heels touch the ground, you start from one again. If the stomach touches the two by four, you start from one again. It was almost impossible. So I was number four. There were three men ahead of me. The first one goes up, bends over, and they started to hit and he's yelling, I fight, right? Every time they hit him, you can see a line of blood coming through the trousers. And he miscounted. His heel touched the ground and again and again and again, finally collapsed, he fell. As he fell, the commandant goes over, kicks him in the face, says, get up. He couldn't. He pulls out the revolver and shoots him right in the temple. His Fräulein, his girlfriend was with him and she saw that. She walks over to him, gives him a hug and a kiss like he just performed the heroic act. He killed a man. Number two went up. Same way, he too fell apart, miscounted. Again, his feet touched the ground. His stomach touched the two by four. Again, start again and again, finally he falls. The commandant kicks him. Again, he can't get up, he shoots him. The third man went up the same way. The third man was a little younger. So he yelled out, please have mercy on me, don't shoot me. 
the commandant says to him, okay, then stand up, come over here and face me. Poor guy stands up, makes five steps, his feet gave out from under him, he fell, he fell, he goes over, shoots him. Now we had three dead bodies and Ben Lesser is next in line. I'll never forget, I walk up to that sawhorse. I bend over without touching the two by four, tiptoed, and I said to myself, Ben, this is it. If you want to live another hour, you better do exactly what you told. No ifs or buts, no questions, just do it exactly right, which is what I did. I bent over, one man is holding my trousers tight, the other one is hitting, and I start to yell, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Finally, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 25. I made it. You can hear a pin drop in the camp. For no one believes that anyone could survive this. When the commandant saw that, and the man who was holding my trousers tight says to me in Yiddish, he says, go over and thank the commandant. So I start walking over, blood's running down my trousers, my legs. I walk over to him, I sa salute him, and I say, Danke schön, Herr Commandant. When he hears that, he puts his hand on my shirt collar, twists me around, facing those two number 10s who are still to be beaten. He says, now I told you it could be done. If you do it like this, Junge, if you do it like this, young one, you have nothing to worry about. As he was saying that, there is a commotion at the gate. They caught those three inmates. And as they pulled them in, those three inmates, you couldn't recognize it. Anyway, to make a long story, just like a, like a child, get sick of a toy, he got sick of a number 10. He sent us all back into our original lines and he instructs his hunchman to bring down a portable gallow and they had to hang those three inmates one by one. We all had to watch. Anyway, what went on afterwards, I'm running out of time. I can only tell you that, uh, uh, a few weeks later, we heard some cannon fire. The front was closing in. And uh, that morning, we reported to go to work. There was a loudspeaker saying, no one is working today. The camp is being evacuated. Line up a rows of fives. My cousin and I, we, we were next to each other. We, they marched us out. My uncle was already in the kitchen working. We couldn't even say goodbye to him. We never saw him again. This was the end of it. We never saw. And my uncle, we don't know what happened to him, but he didn't survive the war. And they're now death marching us. This was called a death march because you could not keep step with the soldiers. They simply shot you. And all day long and all night long, you heard pop, pop, people were being shot. And my cousin got very weak on me. He says, Ben, let me sit down. They'll shoot me and I'll be over with. Anyway, this is a long story. I thought in my book, you'll see that I only marched about three or four weeks. We lost time. We were just like zombies. I found out from a German professor recently said, Mr. Lesser, you made a mistake. You marched seven weeks. You marched 450 kilometers from Dernhau to Buchenwald. It's 455 kilometers or something. And I marched. The last few days of March, our shoes fell apart and we were marching on snow barefooted. To tell you how we arrived there, they counted us, they told us to go in the barrack, they fed us, and we took a shower. This picture is of me inside a shower. That's a story in itself. I don't have time to tell you about this. But the next morning, 
we had fresh clothes on us, new shoes, and they, they in, the, in, in Buchenwald, they lined us up, they counted us, and they marched us out about 300 yards out of the camp. They had cattle cars waiting again, and they lined us up, they pushed us to an 82 cattle car. And as they closed it, I pushed my, my, my cousin up first, and I says, find a good place against the wall so we can rest our back, which we did. We found a place and for me, they saved a place for me and I climbed in afterwards and they closed the door. And after an hour, they opened up the door and they threw in 80 breads, a bread for every person. Now remember, there were 80 of us, imagine um, those people who were next to the war door were grabbing five or six breads. And I and my cousin were against the wall. We had nothing. We don't know where we're going for how long we're going to be gone. We had not a, not a crumb of bread. So I knew I had to get a bread. I started to climb over the sitting inmate's head to get to the door to wrestle out a bread from somebody who had several. And as I was climbing, one inmate had a pocket knife and he stabs me in my throat. I feel that my mouth is filling up with blood, but I didn't have time to get involved. I have to get a bread. So I'm climbing and this one had a bunch of breads. I pull one out, he punches me and I put it in my back pocket and I climb back to my cousin. He says, Ben, what's happening to you? You're bleeding. I put my finger here it went through my tongue. I had a big gash, big hole. It's a miracle, one miracle after another. If you read my story, there were eight miracles happening one after another to Ben Lesser. And for some reason or another, I, I arrived. I didn't know that I stopped in a town called Nemering because it took three weeks um, over 6,000 people in this transport, they were taking us from Buchenwald to Dachau, three weeks without food or water. And in the town of Nemering, they stopped in about, I think, almost 300, 290 people were shot. And it's a whole story about that separately, um, completely separate, very interesting. And in Germany, they wrote a book about it, and it's now they're teaching it in, 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 in high schools in Bavaria about the train, the death train in memory. And out of these 6,000 people, only 18 of us walked out in Dachau. And I am one of the 18, my cousin and I. My cousin dies in my arm three days later, the night after liberation, he dies in my arm. And unfortunately, uh, today, this was the death train that you see a cattle car out of one of those cattle cars that I came out of. Only 18 out of 6,000 walked out alive. Today, I'm the only survivor. And coming into the camp, this is the mountain of bodies that I saw. It's a long story. Um, all I can tell you is I was liberated and, uh, and, and the night of liberation, my cousin dies in my arm. Um, it's something that you have to, you have to uh, find out the entire story because it's one miracle after another. It's, I see I went about 15 minutes over my limited time. So if you have any questions, then ask, I will gladly answer it if I have enough time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben, for taking the time to share your story and uh, share so much detail. And thank you, Gail, for helping with the PowerPoint and all the uh, photos and paintings and drawings. Um, we have a few uh, questions in the Q&A box and a lot of people are thanking you um, and sending you um, all of their love and support in the chat. Um, 
we have one question. Uh, where did you meet your wife? Was she also a survivor? No, my wife wasn't sur not a survivor. I met her and we got married in 1950 and we have a beautiful family. Um, you saw a picture of almost the whole family, uh, which was taken recently. Uh, yes, I, she's not a survivor, but she is. Uh, uh, she was. She is a daughter from uh, from a Russian immigrant who came uh, at the turn of the century to the United States. A story in itself, by itself. And my sister Lola, here you see a picture of her and uh, her two sons to the right and her daughter. And this is the rest of her family, which this picture was taken about five, six years ago. By now, by now they number almost 80. Uh, Kanina Horror. Thank you. Um, and we have another question. What is the name of your book? name of my book is Living a Life That Matters. And I'll show you a picture of it. Living a Life That Matters, From Nazi Nightmare to American Dream. From Nazi Nightmare to American Dream by Ben Lesser. And uh, it's something that uh, I feel it's worthwhile reading. And I had a question. You showed um, some photos of your family members. Um, yes. Yeah. How did you get those photos? I know it's for a lot of survivors. They weren't able to get their family photos back after. My sister Lola and Michael, they were never in the camp. They were hiding out in Budapest as Ar on Aryan papers and in other places, running from place to place. So they were able to save some of the photographs because they were not interned in a camp. Uh, and how do you feel when people use Holocaust imagery or Holocaust comparisons to relate to current events going on? Well, there's nothing in history you can ever relate to current event. I mean, there were a lot of atrocities going on in the world, but the Holocaust is something that you cannot compare to anything. And when I see it done, it hurts me very much because it, it's, it's something you can't even describe. I can talk to you guys for three hours, tell you stories that your, your eyes and ears will op open up. You never believed that the human being is able, capable of these atrocities that I, these eyes have seen. So don't compare it. No, you can't compare. Thank you. Uh, and someone asked, how did you regain your faith in humanity after enduring what you did? It's a good question. I lost my faith in humanity. But you know, when Israel was born and they were, and, and it became a state, to me, it gave me some new life. I figured, my God, what a terrible price to pay. But something good came out of it the state of Israel. And I feel if there had not been a Holocaust, as terrible as it was, there would not have been an Israel today. Maybe someday in the future, but not today. It was sped up. It was a terrible price. You can't even compare. But that brought back some faith in humanity. Maybe there was a reason that you and I, as human beings, cannot really see the picture, the overview of the entire picture, 
why this happened. And who knows where this is going to lead us to a better world. There is a state of Israel. And I mean, so many miracles happened. Even Israel, the birth of Israel, one miracle after another. And I, so I have to say, perhaps the Holocaust was in some way, some way responsible for it. So it gives me some, some um, solace, some good feeling about, uh, if you can say that, with, about what happened. Um, but you can't compare. This was the biggest tragedy in human history ever, ever, ever. And, and it shows you something. These people who were killers were not born monsters. They were human, like you and I. Shows you how far hatred would go. If you hate someone, it's so easy to kill. So the hatred has to stop any hatred in the world. Why hate? We're all God's creation. Why can't we live side by side and appreciate our differences rather than hate them? What makes you different than me? You're part of humanity. You're the same. So I feel maybe, maybe, hopefully, that some people who learn about the Holocaust and know how far hate went will perhaps grow up and their children will grow up to be better people. You know, the Nazis and Hitler did not start with killing. It all started with hate. So the hatred has to stop. We're all equals. Imagine a world, Hitler envisioned a world of ubermenschen, superior human beings like the Nordic types, blonde hair, blue eyes. He wasn't even one, but this was his vision. Imagine a world where everybody looks the same and everybody thinks the same. You have to be a Nazi. If you were not a Nazi, you had no right to exist. So everybody is blonde, blue eyes. The beautiful beauty in this world is that we are different. We look different. We think different. That makes it beautiful. Appreciate who you are. Appreciate your friend, your neighbor. We're all part of humanity. We make part of this world. Love, love, forget about it. Thank you. Uh, and there's a question from someone watching the stream on Facebook. Uh, what were the reactions of the soldiers who liberated you? The soldiers who were liberated were completely in shock. They couldn't believe what they saw. They thought it was a something out of out of, out of space. They didn't think this is possible. They saw the 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 inmates were crawling on their hands and knees and kissing the boots of the GIs. They were like gods to us. And we, I have no idea how they felt about us. I wasn't one of them. But I can just imagine they were frightened to see these skeletons, people that have never seen people like this before. Skin and bone, walking, skin and bone. And they, they, they felt sorry for us. They gave us whatever little food they could find. And we were so hungry, so starved. We made a mistake, we ate it. 
which was a mistake because our stomach could not tolerate it. So most, a lot of us were dying from desenteria. My cousin dies a night of liberation in my arm. He survived a war, what we went through and I lost him. My God, I think really is that he, he really wanted to give up and die many times. He couldn't take it, but he kept going to keep me alive because he felt if he went, I would give up. And maybe I stayed alive because I felt because I didn't want him to give up. Who knows? Who knew those things? We're not gods, but we as human beings, why? Why discriminate? Why hate? Why make a difference between one another? We should all love each other. We're, be grateful that we are in this beautiful world. Ben, why don't you mention about liberation, how you were actually, who came up to you and took you when you were liberated? Well, <laughs> what do you mean who took me? Well, after, after your cousin died in your arms, afterwards, a gentleman came walking up to you yeah. that evening and yeah if i have enough time i didn't know that I, I did um it was the third day after um after we arrived in dachau we were laying on the floor and we hear a frying but frying liberation americans and we walk out and we see what's happening um uh, they they took my 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 cousin away from me because he was dead in my arm and as they took him away I followed I didn't want to know I wanted to know where are you taking him so as I walk my feet gave out from under me and I fell and as I fell they pushed me against the wall a couple hours later a man walks up to me nicely dressed and he introduced himself himself as a Jesuit priest who came from Paris with a bunch of nuns and they opened up a field hospital in the, in the yard of Dachau and he's going to make me take me into the field hospital. Um, he's a Jesuit priest. He picks me up, he puts me on his shoulder and carries me to the infirmary. On the way he tells me something I'll never forget. He says, Benek, what you went through the only crime you committed is that you were born to Jewish parents. What a terrible, unheard of thing in the world to happen to you people. However, he says, don't you ever, ever abandon your noble religion. To hear that in 1945 from a Jesuit priest was unbelievable, unheard of. Today you might hear something like this. And he took me into the infirmary and none took my vitals and gave me um, some, some, some medication. I passed out. And two months later, I woke up in Santa Tillian in a monastery in Bavaria, where the monks gave up a building to rehabilitate the survivors from Dachau. And um, that's where I woke up and I came alive. I actually was born in Santa Tillian. After two months of coma, I woke up. I remember the nun who saw that started to yell. He, he's, he's open, he's open, he's alive, he's alive. The story goes on and on. I'm sure that I'm running out of time. These are pictures from Santa Tillian. Um, to this date, we, we are still invited every year, every other year, whenever possible. Um, because of the pandemic, we were not able to go the last couple of years, but we always go there and meet with the monks. And we're very close, all of us. 
Today, I'm the only survivor, by the way, left. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try to fit in just a couple more questions. Um, one from someone who said they're watching with their mom and their 12 year old brother uh, and their brother would like to know what kind of food you were given in the camps. Oh, I guess. Um, the food in the camp was very minimal. Um, a piece of bread, they call it bread, but it was actually made out of sawdust. You hardly believe it. You hardly bite into it. A little slice of it like that. And they had liverwurst on it and something called um, uh, what they call margarine a little bit on there. That was the ration for 24 hours, that little piece. And they also gave us a cup of coffee that was ersatz coffee. It wasn't coffee. It was made out of grains, um, black stuff, something. And we drank that. Um, and in the evening, they gave us what they call a soup. It was called a gemüse, a soup made out of who knows what, vegetables, uh, junk, car garbage, whatever they could find they threw in there. Uh, in our camp, one person found a rat in that soup. And, and we were so grateful to get whatever we can get out of it. And the man who was dealing out the soup, doling out the soup, if he knew you, if you have a friend, he went down a little lower to give you a little bit of the bottom stuff so you can have some something decent food. We were starved for years actually starved food. We could eat anything, anything that you could never dream that a human being could eat. If, if it's a mouse, a rat, a bird, anything we can get was food. We didn't have that. We didn't have it. Uh, and how old were you when you were liberated? 16. I was 16 years old when I was liberated. I started out at the age of uh, almost 10, nine and three quarters. And it was eight miracles. If you read my book or if you um, know my story, eight miracles that are all really unbelievable that could happen to anyone happened to me one after another. And I asked my question, why? Why, why was I so fortunate to survive eight times? I was almost dead, almost killed, and I came out of it alive. I felt it was God's hand. He led me to survive the war. Look, I'm a human being it's like everybody else, but because of these miracles, I have dedicated my life and I started a foundation for that purpose only to keep the memory alive, to keep the world from acquiring amnesia. You have to remember, you have to remember. I, I feel that my Dear departed one, all six million of them are crying out to the world in a single word, Zahor, remember, remember us, we were here. Thank you for listening. If you have more questions, I'm not trying to brush you up. I'll gladly answer them, but I, I know uh, it's getting past the time. R R Rochelle, what do you think? Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, someone wrote in the chat, Ben, you tell your heart-wrenching story with every molecule of yourself, with such intensity, with such passion, to relive this by sharing your story with us. What message do you want us to take away and carry on to others? There's, there's a couple of messages. If, one, I'll tell you this. 
I want you to know while individuals can't always choose what happened to them, but whether it's a crisis or a calamity, people can choose to either let it ruin their lives or to learn from it and move forward. It's essential to understand the consequences of personal choices. It's possible to let tragedy or trauma become a reason to stop living. But it's also possible to live through extreme circumstances and commit to a life that has meaning, a life that matters. And the other one, the other the one is please stop the hatred. There is no room for hate in this world. Why not appreciate our differences rather than hate them? Don't hate. You see how far hatred could lead. Children who go to, go to school and they, they learn to hate, they'll grow up who knows what kind of monsters. There is no room for hate. Even if you bully someone in school, you make an enemy for life. You're gonna have somebody hating you for the rest of your life. Why do that? Once you hate, you don't know how far, what the person can do if he hates you hard, hard enough. Stop the hatred. Let's, let's, let's love. Let's choose love instead of hate. All and I'm Gail, Ben's daughter, and I just want to mention one thing. You know, I hear the story all the time, over and over, and it's just just gets me every single time. But um, one of the things that Ben does reach out to his students, especially when he speaks to students, is um, you know for them to go home and be grateful for what they have and tell the story that they just learned, uh, and. You know, it, it's about educating. It's about educating the youth out there uh, and to for the youth to even go home and sit at the dinner table with their parents and tell them that they heard a Holocaust survivor. This is why these stories must go on. This is why the second and third and fourth generation need to be continuing and telling the stories of their of their fathers and um, and mothers and grandparents. The story needs to go on and they need to keep sharing it. Um, one of the things that we do, I don't know, I just mentioned real fast is one of the things that we do is we give out these Zahor pins, um, which is a remembrance of the story that they just heard. And with that pin goes the story. So um, it's you know up to the listener to pass the story forward to pay the story forward so the the next generations will be able to um, to learn from it. Very well, Gail. Can I say one more thing? Um, when you go home this evening or after work, be sure you appreciate your parents. Don't take them for granted. Give your mother and father and even your, your siblings a hug and a kiss show that, that you don't take them for granted, appreciate them. And there is so much that we can do to promote love instead of hate. Let's all do that. Every one of you who listen to me, and I wish you all a happy and a healthy and prosperous year this coming 2022. And please, Remember, stop the hatred. Love, love is the answer. You know, I also want to say real quick, a song, there are some songs that have been written uh, through Ben's um, stories, and it's a long story. But if you do visit our website, I do have it up there. There's some very educational programs in there. Uh, the, the, about, the part about the music, the part about uh, Ben's um, AI, his artificial intelligence. You could talk to him at any time and ask him questions and he will be happy to do it. We are not 
we we speak at museums all the time we speak for organizations around the world um, we are a foundation of our own and um, it's ben's legacy to get that word and that education out there so come visit us thank you so much uh, ben for taking the time to share your story with us today um, for sharing so much uh, detail and so many photos and telling us about your family members um, and passing on their memory to us. Thank you so much. And thank you, Gail, for joining as well. Um, for more information about our programs at Holocaust Museum LA, you can visit holocaustmuseumla.org. And for more information about the Zahor Foundation, you can visit zahorafoundation.org. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and wishing you all a happy and healthy new year. Thank, Thank you, you, Rachel.